Thanks very much, Bob. Um, it's great to be here. Um, so I'll just give a quick overview of, of how we're going to divide the, the labor division here for the talk. I'm, part one is going to be from me, and I'm going to talk a little bit about background and context um, as it relates to HIV care coordination and, and the, the work that Mary's going to present. Um, I'll introduce you to the CORD study, which is the study that we um, were recently funded to do to look at the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of HIV care coordination. Um, and I want to talk brief, briefly about some of the sort of methodological work that's happening as part of this study to, to use HIV and AIDS surveillance data to, to, uh, to measure outcomes and to assess effectiveness um, in, in, in our study, but I think the potential to do it for many other studies is there. Um, and then Mary will talk about the Ryan White Part A Care Coordination Program, um, the, the program that we're assessing the effectiveness for. She'll talk um, some, about some of our initial uh, findings coming out of the CORD study, um, short-term outcomes and effectiveness, and talk about ongoing study priorities and, and next steps. So by the end, um, hopefully everyone will have a sense of, of where, um, why, we're, why we're doing this, this CORD study, which is just finishing its first year. Um, and um, where, where we hope to, to go with it and what we're beginning to find. <clears throat> so part of, uh, part of what uh, motivates us to do these large-scale service, uh, service delivery program studies is, is about the, the implementation gap, the, the gap between, or part of the implementation gap that uh, is between finding efficacious interventions and then effectively implementing them um, to maximize impact. Of course, we have many evidence-based strategies for HIV prevention, um, and we also have HIV care and ART, which are known to be highly efficacious um, for improving outcomes as well as preventing onward transmission. Um, and, and these have been shown to be efficacious in, in clinical trials, of course. Um, but as all of us know, efficacy doesn't always translate into population level effectiveness, um, especially when, evident, when, when these interventions are taken to scale. And so major implementation gaps um, remain, and that is the, um, you know, what we can see very clearly on the HIV care continuum. This is the latest HIV care continuum for New York City um, that I think is pretty much hot off the press um, for two, 2013. Um, and it certainly conveys some of the implementation gaps that I'm alluding to. Um, it also conveys, I think, the, the difficulty of reaching all people in need of care and art with only 43% of those infected achieving viral suppression, um, and the need for interventions that target you know, much more than one point on the HIV care continuum. Um, you know, it, it's likely that the people who are able to make their way through the care continuum and, and achieve viral suppression um, are different from, and the barriers and enablers um, that, that each of these uh, individuals may have are probably different between those who are able to make it further along in the continuum um, compared with those who are not. Um, and if you could, if you, another thing to think about is if, if you could get, get some of these folks who are, you know, not achieving viral suppression further along in the care continuum, it may be that some of the successful interventions that have resulted in these 43 percent getting to uh, treatment and viral suppression might not be the same strategies and interventions that would be needed to get everyone else there. So there might be, even though, you know, clearly, you know, once you can get someone um, linked and retained in care, the success is pretty high in getting them virally suppressed. And that's because there are, there are strategies around treatment adherence and there are existing strategies that have worked for, for these people or you know, in some way or another. But those folks who did not make it this far may require those interventions and additional different ones that um, I think are yet to be identified. And it's really highlighting, I think, the, the uh, need for interventions uh, around linkage and retention. So, um, so, so the, we, have lot, we have ART as the efficacious intervention, um, but a lot needs to happen for people to get there. Um, and, and, and this cascade evidence is some of the barriers that, um, that they are, uh, or, or can, can, can evidence some of the barriers and, and hopefully, um, you know, we, we begin to identify interventions that, that can address them. Um, I think everyone knows the age strategy. So I want to focus a little bit by talking about linkage and retention intervention because I think that's where some of the biggest gaps on the HIV care continuum are, at least in New York City. Um, so, um, 
some folks in this room, um, Bob, involved in, in the development of these guidelines from IAPAC um, that did a systematic review to identify evidence-based interventions to improve outcomes along the, care, the entire care continuum. Um, and they resulted in, in 37, they reviewed the quality of the evidence and made 37 evidence-based recommendations based on these, these, um, this review. Um, five of them focused on linkage and retention. And these included things like systematic monitoring of entry into care for all diagnosed, monitoring of retention in, in care, um, intensive outreach and engagement for newly diagnosed patients who are not in care, use of peer or paraprofessional patient navigators, and artists, a brief strength-based case management in, um, intervention for newly diagnosed patients. Um, this is the, the artist study. Um, many of you may remember it was an RCT that uh, compared case management to usual care for newly diagnosed. And um, what, what they found was that those who got the intervention um, case management um, had, had, were more likely to have one visit within six, one care visit within six months of diagnosis compared to usual care, 78% versus 60%. And looking more um, out at uh, out to 12 months, um, the the difference was sustained: 64% versus 49%. Um, so Artis is one of the um, one of the interventions with RCT level evidence um, that that can be used to address uh, outcomes on the early part of the care continuum linkage. Um, there have been some other. Uh, studies published since those guidelines um, that I think probably would be considered if, the, if that process were revisited. Um, one here is, is uh, a study that looked, it was a pre-post study that looked at the impact of a low effort intervention, putting brochures, posters, and other and, and, and messages from clinic staff about the importance of, of maintaining regular care and, and the improvements in long-term outcomes that can result from that. Um, a small but significant improvement in, um, in, in care uh, adherence and visit adherence was observed um, in, in this study. So this is uh, an example of an intervention that's targeting retention. Um, and uh, more recently, um, similar people in, in that group that published the low effort intervention did, um, completed an RCT at six HIV clinics. Um, and this was a study that uh, tried to see what the impact of a randomized study that had uh, three arms, the usual care, and an enhanced contact uh, care whereby one clinic staff person was responsible for regularly contacting patients um, and, and talking to them about the, uh, in a personal way about the, their, uh, their, their care, their need for, for care, and things like that. And then a, a third arm had this regular personal contact combined with some skills based training, um, innovation, in, um, sort of um, uh, strength-based case management kind of, um, or strength-based strength counseling to improve um, self-efficacy. And so they compared these three arms, and uh, unfortunately they didn't find a difference between the enhanced contact alone and the enhanced contact plus skills building, um, but these two, so but both of these groups did better than the usual care with regard to outcomes like visit constancy and visit adherence. Um, what they didn't find was an effect among substance users and, and persons with other unmet needs, such as housing, um, employment, mental health. Um, and, and, and so um, this, this highlights the, the fact that, um, you know, there are the people that are not further along on the care continuum um, have, may have significant and difficult barriers to address. Um, they did not look at the outcome of viral suppression. This was really the, the outcome of uh, visit adherence and, and sort of engagement in care um, and retention. Um, and of course, there's, there's, um, there will be something coming down the pike soon um, from HPTN 065, um, which is evaluate, out, evaluating um, several strategies that target things along the HIV care continuum from testing linkage to viral suppression and um, <coughs> The, uh, uh, I, I guess one of the important interventions that will be uh, helpful to see is, is the financial incentives, whether or not financial incentives can work to get people to be retained in care and achieve viral suppression. Um, that study is ongoing here in the Bronx and in Washington, D.C. with control groups in, in, in Chicago, uh, Houston, Miami, and Philadelphia. So care coordination, where does care coordination fit in in the, in the interventions um, that are targeting the care continuum? Well, um, AHRQ defined care coordination as the deliberate organization of patient care activities 
between two or more participants involved in a patient's care to facilitate the appropriate delivery of health care services. It's a very broad definition, um, but it's this idea that you know, care is, is being coordinated and delivered by one or more people. Um, and IOM, in, in, a, in, a, in a review, um, identified care coordination as an important priority for improving health care outcomes broadly. Um, with regard to HIV, they didn't find evidence for effectiveness. It, it wasn't because there were studies done that, and, and it was shown to be ineffective. It was because there was a lack of studies. And I think that's, that's sort of where some of the work that we're going to talk about comes in. Um, and some recent commentaries, including by um, Steve Marin here, um, have called for examination of, of interventions that combine biomedical, behavioral, and social interventions. Mm -hmm. Um, and explicitly mentioned further exploration of HIV care coordination as a means of improving outcomes to achieve the goals of the National HIV AIDS Strategy. So um, in late 2009, before the National HIV AIDS Strategy came out, the City Department of Health um, began you know, going through some of the evidence-based interventions that, that I've covered and others um, to begin to design and implement a, a care coordination program and they implemented this um, quite to, to a large scale at 28 Ryan White funded clinics across New York City. Um, it's targeting patients who are at high risk for suboptimal care outcomes, such as those that have a history of poor care outcomes um, or, or um, difficulty adhering to medication, development of resistance, things like this. Um, targeting patients with uh, several, tar targeting several outcomes along the care continuum, as I mentioned, which I, I think is an important quality of this intervention. Um, it combines aspects of various evidence-based elements into a, a package. So we have case management and some of the things we saw recommended by IAPAC and subsequently by, by studies um, of linkage and retention later on. Case management, patient navigation, directly observed therapy for those who need it, structured health promotion in home and field visits, and outreach to assist patients in accessing needed and related services. Um, Mary's going to talk in a little bit more detail about the care coordination program in her part of the talk, um, but it, it is uh, purely a service delivery program. There was no control group um, that was uh, included as part of this, this program rollout and certainly no, no randomization. Um, and so. Um, that led us to, um, over quite a period of time, of, of trying to, to, to get funding to do a rigorous evaluation of the program effectiveness. We eventually did um, receive a grant to do this from NIMH, um, and these are our study aims. Um, the first one is to assess the short and long-term effectiveness of the care coordination program, um, and we use, we're using outcomes of care, care engagement as, and viral suppression um, as the primary outcomes of the study. And we're comparing um, care coordination participants' uh, outcomes with those of similar people living with HIV who do not receive the, uh, the intervention. So we're constructing a control group, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, soon. And then um, focusing on those who enroll in the care coordination program um, as part of any, any implementation work, it's always good to see you know, for whom the intervention is more or less effective. What are the factors that are associated with, with better outcomes? Um, or worse outcomes among those who are receiving the intervention. And again, looking at short and long term. Um, and finally, we're uh, interested in assessing the cost effectiveness, um, assuming we find some levels of effectiveness, um, and looking at the cost effectiveness of care coordination relative to usual, usual care, considering both the outcomes in the individual patients and the cost, as well as cost savings that could result of, um, from, from societal benefits, such as uh, HIV infections averted. Um, and the, uh, yeah, so there's a cost effective effectiveness component to this as well. Um, I'll talk briefly about the methods. This is uh, for AIM-1. We, we are going to be using HIV AIDS surveillance data to include external non-care coordination comparison groups of similar persons living with HIV who they meet the CCP eligible, eligibility criteria. Um, but they don't receive the intervention. And those will be drawn from about 38,000 or so people living with HIV who are contemporaneously receiving HIV care in New York City. Um, AIM-2 involves interviews to get at um, factors that you know, wouldn't ordinarily be reflected in surveillance data or other, um, or other electronic medical record data um, to assess kinds of things that are influencing outcomes in the care coordination program. So we'll be interviewing about 600 active 
care coordination clients and about 120 clients who were lost to follow up um, and that dropped out of the program to further assess outcome determinants. Um, and AIM-3 is about assessing cost effectiveness, as I mentioned. Um, we'll use effectiveness estimates from AIM-1, costing data derived from the care coordination program, um, administrative um, uh, activities and site assessments, and we'll be using a locally validated HIV transmission model um, to look at in infections averted. Um, the data sources that we're using come from eShare, the system that Mary's team developed at the City Health Department to, um, to monitor outcomes and collect data on outcomes in the Ryan White program. Um, so but by matching eShare data with the HIV surveillance registry, um, we'll be able to, to look at outcome data that will be derived primarily from surveillance. Um, and you can see sort of a, uh, a visual representation here. A, a, this, this uh, almost the smallest circle represents the 6,000 or so pa patients who have enrolled in care coordination to date. The colored circle represents the 600 sample of 600 that we'll be interviewing. You can see the rest of the Ryan White patients, about 13,000, and the rest of other people in New York City who meet the care coordination eligibility criteria. Um, and then the others who, who uh, who are in care and so forth. So it's sort of a um, concentric circles of, of potential comparison groups that we could draw on. Um, so some knowledge gaps that we think will be filled by the study. Um, we will be able to assess the effectiveness of a comprehensive package of evidence-based structural and individualized interventions. Um, we'll also be able to look, there's some important transformations going on right now in the healthcare system whereby um, some individuals are transferring, will be, will be transitioning out of Ryan White um, into health homes under Medicaid, and it's important, to, um, and these are very different sort of care environments potentially, and, and we will be able to follow them as, as that happens and, and monitor the outcomes. Um, we'll generate important evidence related to the effectiveness of, of care coordination, a promising scalable service delivery strategy, and I guess some of the questions behind the questions are, are more the methodologic ones. How well can we do an assessment of effectiveness and cost effectiveness um, in an observational study uh, in a large scale service delivery setting? Can we develop robust methods using population HIV AIDS surveillance data to do this um, that, that could you know, work for our study, but also for other people who may want to do uh, similar effectiveness studies? Um, and of course, care coordination has the potential to impact other conditions in addition to HIV AIDS. Um, those in people living with HIV, as well as um, persons without HIV infection, and we're, we're seeing um, this, this thing kind of pop up in other areas. There's a New York Times article recently talking about um, care coordination for, um, for Medicare patients to, to incentivize the, uh, that kind of activity. So, Transitioning into sort of the methodological part, um, can, can, we, can we develop methods to use surveillance data to get at effectiveness, um, both for observational and experimental studies? Um, in our study, all of the outcome measurements for care coordination clients and control clients will come from population-based HIV surveillance data. Um, this happens because of a routine match that happens between the care coordination program data and eShare and the HIV surveillance registry. And I just want to spend a little bit uh, of time orienting people to how surveillance <coughs> works in New York City um, and New York State. It's uh, active and passive surveillance. Information is reported from healthcare providers and hospitals. Um, this is about 80 hospitals, 500 freestanding clinics, and 2,200 private medical providers um, all, all report information to the health department that is, is captured in the HIV surveillance registry on newly diagnosed patients and existing patients. And then also laboratories, about 70 or so laboratories, report um, information on a regular basis to that gets incorporated into the HIV surveillance registry. Um, and it includes now to date every case of AIDS reported in New York City since 1981, every case of HIV reported since 2000, and that amounts <laughs> to about 220,000 people um, about 50% of whom have died um, since the beginning of the epidemic. Um, it's population-based in that it, it captures nearly all events related to HIV that occur, um, that are diagnosed, and um, it's continually updated longitudinally with new laboratory information on diagnoses, CD4 counts, 
viral load and genotyping, not just the first of occurrence of these, but every single one that occurs for a patient over time. So it's longitudinal. And um, so it's a massive amount of information. Over 6 million reports have been received since 2000, and about a million laboratory tests per year on the 120,000 people who are diagnosed and living with HIV today in New York City. Mm -hmm. Importantly, it does not capture any information on treatment status. It's really only the laboratory information um, that goes there. <laughs> Yeah. So, so you could, I mean, I know that it won't give any identifying information, but you can see a, a patient's trajectory over time. I mean, so it's not just group, it's not just a community trajectory over time. It, it's, okay. That's right. It does have the identifying information, actually. So each person's information is, is linked right. over time and identifiable, and that's how matches can occur between for example, the registry and the um, care coordination. Right, but I was just thinking when, like, if a researcher has to have access oh. to it, I assume that it wouldn't be identifying, but if you wanted to see, if you wanted to compare trajectories of patients over time, you could do it as opposed to just yes, like, exactly. community viral load over time or something like that. Exactly, and that's, when, that's what we're, we're trying to do as part of this work. Yeah, so it's this surveillance data that results in some of the population level, um, you know, information <laughs> that comes out, including the cascade. Um, but I want to reiterate that there's no information on whether or not a person's on treatment in, in the surveillance data, which is a challenge. Um, so just to make it really concrete, I, I prepared a visualization to give you a sense of what we're trying to do. So if this is New York City, um, and my visualization is a little slow, um, <laughs> these, uh, these, these gray circles represent all people diagnosed and living with HIV in New York. By matching with the care coordination data or some other intervention database, you can identify who among these individuals are receiving the intervention, right? Um, and because the data are longitudinal, not only do you know what happens to them afterwards, you, you, you may know information about where they were before leading up to the time that they received the intervention. Um, and you can even identify um, people who are otherwise similar to those who are receiving the intervention using methods like matching or propensity score analysis or just applying simple eligibility criteria to them. Um, and you can group them into exposed and unexposed um, and follow them forward in time. And um, depending on what your outcomes may be, you can um, use the CD4 viral load data um, and uh, other information on diagnosis dates to construct things like linkage rates, um, estimating retention in care and engagement in care based on the frequency with which people receive lab test results. And you can look at viral suppression, um, not just at one point in time, but over time. And so for any intervention, in theory, you could compare proportions of people who um, have the outcome in a, in a control group and those who are in an intervention group. Um, and for the care coordination patients um, that we're looking at, um, this is sort of our schema that we used um, to describe how we would follow things over time. Here's where patients enroll in care coordination, um, but because the surveillance data is continuously updated over time, we can look at, at what was happening with them before they enrolled, as well as what happens afterwards. And so we have a pre-baseline period and a, and a short-term outcome period from one to 12 months and a long-term outcome period from 13 to 36 months. Um, and we can look at um, a similar uh, set of time periods for people who are, are not enrolled in the care coordination program or a control group. Um, so at this point, um, with a little bit of orientation there, um, okay, well, quick question. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> How do you deal with, and maybe you're as big as this, but how do you deal with site as a, um, a, an issue when you're trying to match patients? Do, are there patients at the same site who didn't receive the care coordination, and are they in some way systematically different, or is it just that you didn't end up being offered it, or, or do you look at other sites that might look similar to the site for the care coordination? Yeah, I, I, the answer is, but we can do both, and we probably will do both. Um, but the, there, are, there are reasons to be uh, cautious about those patients at the same site who are eligible but didn't enroll. We don't know what the reasons might be for that. So there could be selection bias. A better group might be patients at other Ryan White um, programs that, that don't have care coordination but are otherwise similar. Um, and, and 
Were the, was everyone offered peer coordination and only some sites signed up or? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's a competitive uh, bidding process through an RFP. So um, there were some applicants who were not funded, um, but I think most of those who applied were funded. And, and the, the process was designed to sort of make sure that the areas with highest prevalence were covered with a care coordination program. Um, and also it was uh, the the funding was sort of preferentially given to agencies that had a high caseload, a high number of patients with HIV to have the greatest impact. And then those who had smaller caseloads were actually encouraged to sort of form a network and a, a partnership with an agency that could be the lead agency on a networked uh, program. Take it away. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Good <segue>. um. <laughs> Oh, so what I was going to say that was that um, you know we, we're uh, so Mary and I are, are joint PIs on this care coordination effectiveness project, and and I'm turning it over to Mary, who's going to talk about some of our initial findings and progress to date and and future directions. So I'm going to focus actually kind of on this first product from our um, care coordination study uh, that was funded uh, just over a year ago. Um, hooray! Um, and so this is, this is sort of a set of initial results that um, have also just been published. They're currently, you know, online published um, in clinical infectious diseases and in press. Um, and, uh, and so this is sort of part of our AIM-1 work on uh, assessing effectiveness. And these are co-authors on the project. Um, so just to sort of give a little background, I'll talk a little bit about sort of uh, the care coordination program roots um, and the context within Ryan White Park <coughs> in New York City. Um, and so you all know a lot of this, um, and we've we've sort of just kind of listed some of the major barriers that have been recognized, uh, major factors for suboptimal outcomes with HIV, um, starting with the more sort of basic demographic factors and getting into more sort of structural, social, and psychological behavioral um, factors uh, for poor outcomes and non-aid status probably just because many people if they don't have to be in care sort of you know postpone um, that's where that you know healthier group tends to be less engaged in care and treatment um, and Brian White so our care coordination program is funded under Ryan White Part A um, and this is part of that legislation, the Ryan White Care Act, uh, Comprehensive AIDS Resources Emergency Act that was passed in 1990, um, and then most recently reauthorized as the Ryan White HIV AIDS Treatment Extension Act in 2009. Um, we hope we'll continue long into the future. Um, and the purpose is to provide care and support services for low-income persons living with HIV and AIDS who have no other payer for services. So it's really a safety net program, and it was designed to um, sort of level the playing field and, and reduce HIV-related health disparities. Um, and, of course, we still have them, but it is a critical program for that purpose. And our, the clients nationwide, uh, HRSA claims about a, a half a million clients are served annually. Um, and the funding uh, nationally is $2.35 billion, at least as of early 2013. Um, in New York City, our portion, our share of that is about 103.9 million annually for uh, New York City, Tri County. Uh, Tri County is Putnam, Rockland, and Westchester counties. Um, that's our New York eligible metropolitan area, and it's Part A funding, which is emergency assistance to eligible metropolitan areas and transitional grant areas, which can be states that are most severely affected by the epidemic, sort of based on the um, the prevalence. So our program population for care coordination is meant to sort of be the, um, the sort of hardest hit of the hardest hit. So it's those uh, at greatest risk of suboptimal care outcomes. This is the only Ryan White uh, Part A program that we have in New York City that sort of uh, had an established set of medical need criteria. So the providers are, meant, are expected to actually assess clients for these criteria before enrolling them. So it's not just sort of open to anyone. Um, it's really for those who are newly diagnosed, uh, previously lost to care or never in care, um, have sporadic care patterns, have initiated a new regimen, or have shown incomplete medication adherence or um, incomplete response to treatment, so viral rebound, for example. Um, so this is uh, sort of really targeting what was expected to be and, and turns out to be about 25% of our HIV positive Ryan White population, this group with the greatest barriers. And uh, Dennis mentioned some of these. The components of the program include uh, traditional case management, 
patient navigation, uh, including accompaniment. So this is really sort of a community health worker type person who's um, spending the most time with the clients, um, doing the most client-facing services. Um, adherence support, including uh, where needed, directly observe therapy. But the prescription for that part of the program is really for people who failed on regular kinds of adherence support, people who have shown that that's not sufficient. And in, that, in those cases, they consider directly observed therapy. It's modified in the sense that it's like five times a week, not every dose necessarily. Um, health promotion and home visiting. Um, health promotion under a curriculum that we actually borrowed um, from PACT, the PACT program in Boston, which was a um, partnership between Partnership in Health and Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Um, so it's a very structured curriculum with uh, 16 sort of core modules, and that's been adapted for uh, New York City Care Coordination. And then assistance with all manner of medical and social services. The program is meant to be client-centered and sort of address every possible barrier to care, um, and then coordinate the, the assistance for those medical and social services with an interdisciplinary care team. And the program also is structured in terms of tracks. So this is based on the assessment of acuity of need for the client. Um, clients are put into one of five tracks, and they, of course, can transition between tracks as their needs change. Um, only one track is available for people who are not currently on antiretrovirals, so that's track A. Um, it's quarterly health promotion. People can be in contact with their care coordination team more often, but they only really sort of have that intensive health promotion visit um, once a quarter. And uh, it's, you know, the, some of the focus is on readiness training, sort of readiness uh, counseling around adherence, around ART. And then the other quarterly track is for people on ART, um, but who have sort of less intensive need, and that's track B. Track C1 involves monthly health promotion and monthly adherence assessments. Um, C2, which is where everyone is supposed to start the program, is weekly adherence assessments and weekly health promotion visits. Um, and then track D, as I mentioned, for people who have sort of failed on other kinds of adherence support, um, involves the actual directly observed therapy at least five times a week uh, and weekly health promotion. And for all of these, um, the health promotion is expected to happen in home visits. Um, for clients who are not comfortable having the worker come into their home, they can arrange sort of alternate field locations. Um, and some of, sometimes it happens in the clinic, depending on the barriers uh, for the client around having home visits. And of course, people do sort of go in and out of these tracks. Um, the intent is for them to step down gradually. You know, ideally, a client starts in C2 and steps down gradually to track B. Um, and then graduates from the program entirely when they're considered to be sort of self-sufficient in managing their uh, HIV care and treatment. And this is uh, sort of showing uh, what I mentioned in terms of the funding of the programs to meet the need in terms of the prevalence, geographic prevalence of HIV. Um, this is actually an older uh, 2011 prevalence map, but the start sites are the lead agencies um, in care coordination, and then they have often uh, satellite sites uh, color-coded to match the stars. Um, and you can see that the highest, uh, the highest concentration of uh, sites is in the sort of highest prevalence areas of the city. And this is only New York City. So the care coordination program wasn't translated to our tri-county, uh, Rockland, Westchester, Putnam County areas in the same way because the Westchester Department of Health administers that area. They have something very similar, though, um, <coughs> that is uh, not called care coordination, but it's their medical case management program there. And so we started out with the 28 agencies. Um, you know, in some cases they represented multiple, they, 28 programs, and sometimes there were a few more agencies involved in one program in a network situation, uh, providing care coordination. We lost uh, one just earlier this year that was a small community-based agency um, shifting into the health homes model, sort of full scale. Um, but we, we started out with 16 hospital-based uh, agencies and 12 community-based programs. Um, with caseloads ranging from about 52 to 230 active clients at any given time. Um, and the, that's sort of the distribution. Nine, small programs were those with um, up to 90 clients um, at any one time. 91 to 150 clients are considered medium. And then over 150 clients would be the large programs. Um, and so at any time, we have about 3,300 altogether in New York City in care coordination. And over the course of the year, um, just, just about 5,000 people are served in care coordination, which is about 25% of our Part A population, which was kind of the targeted um, proportion based on the expectation of that sort of more intensive need for case management. Um, so to, to sort of get into the study itself, um, 
we wanted to assess the effectiveness of this large-scale multi-site program and compare specifically engagement in care and viral load suppression um, between the 12-month period before enrollment and the 12-month period after enrollment for each client um, and look at subgroup differences in those outcomes. We focused mainly on subgroups that were based on baseline characteristics, so their characteristics at the time of enrollment into the program. And our data sources, Dennis mentioned uh, both of these. So eShare, we sort of transitioned over from AIRS to eShare e starting in 2011. Our care coordination programs were actually required to do back entry to the beginning of the care coordination period, December 2009, uh, with some help from um, people that we sent over to do that back data entry. But they were collecting data using the same forms from the beginning, December 2009. <coughs> um, and that uh, system is, compared to AIRS, we have access to full identifiers in eShare on all the clients who are enrolled. So that made it possible to do the merge uh, with surveillance data. They're both fully identified. Um, and you can do a very nice uh, sort of confident match of case to case. Um, so our eligible sample for this first analysis uh, required, it was people being enrolled by the end of March 2011 who did match to the HIV surveillance registry and were alive for at least that full year of follow-up after enrollment. Um, and we broke our, our eligible group into sort of three care status groupings. Um, the newly diagnosed, who we defined as being diagnosed in the 12 months before their enrollment in care coordination. Current to care, um, these are both previously diagnosed groups. So if you were previously diagnosed in current to care, that meant that you had evidence of care in the six months before care coordination enrollment. And we use CD4 um, tests and viral load test dates as evidence of care because there's not you know, sort of a record of an actual primary care visit in the uh, surveillance registry. So that's our proxy for a visit. Uh, and then those uh, who were previously diagnosed and out of care, we defined as those who just lacked that evidence of care in the six months before enrollment. So they had no CD4 or viral load test state in the registry in that six month period. Um, and this is just the flow diagram sort of showing you how we got to our final sample. We didn't lose very many people to uh, the failure to match to the registry. So it's just 28 individuals, um, less than 1% who didn't match to the registry. And that can happen because of uh, different names or a very common name and not having enough additional information to confirm a match. Um, and then we lost 3.5% uh, uh, due to death within the six month, within the 12 month follow-up follow period after enrollment, uh, which left us with 3,641 clients uh, who were eligible. And then that's just how they broke out into those three groups, the current to care and out of care among previously diagnosed and the newly diagnosed. Uh, so about 13% were newly diagnosed. Most were uh, previously diagnosed and in care. And the uh, outcome measures, we define engagement in care as having at least, so again, using the labs as proxies of medical visits, having at least two CD4 viral load test dates at least 90 days apart, with at least one in each half of the 12-month period. And viral load suppression was defined as having a viral load um, at or below 200 copies per milliliter on the most recent test in the second half of the 12-month period. And for the purpose of this analysis, we treated those who were lacking any viral load in the second half, half of a 12-month period um, as being unsuppressed. So we, we basically took the lack of a viral load as evidence of being out of care, and then took that to mean that they must be unsuppressed. Um, and we, yes, you can, uh, we can talk about that more later. <laughs> and then we estimated uh, post versus pre-care uh, coordination program enrollment um, relative risks, so that post proportion uh, over the pre-proportion using generalized estimating equations in order to sort of account for the correlation uh, between data points because it was the same people pre and post. And this is just sort of describing the study population, that sample that we use for the analysis. Um, mostly male um, and overwhelmingly black and Hispanic, which reflects our uh, Ryan White Part A population in general. Um, and we, we have sort of the conventional demographics, uh, age, language, country of birth, insurance. We also looked at these um, sort of other factors that we collect in eShare, um, recent hard drug use. Hard drug use was defined as coke, uh, meth, um, heroin, or uh, prescription drugs used recreationally. And we looked at housing status, um, household income, ART status, as you can see, 70% uh, were on ARTs at baseline, year of HIV diagnosis, uh, viral load suppression, and CD4 count. Categories. Um, and our population in Ryan White in general, but also particularly in this, in this sample, 
is uh, slightly more female, uh, more black and Hispanic, um, slightly more recently diagnosed, and more likely, be, more likely to be unsuppressed um, than the general um, population of people living with HIV in New York City who were in care around the same time. Mary, can you just the recently diagnosed, what are you doing? how is that operationalized? We did it as the year before enrollment in the program, so if they were diagnosed any time during that 12-month period before enrollment. But then how does that map on to the current needs? In care, I mean, so, so, so the, the currently in care and currently out of care were people who were diagnosed more than a year. Exactly, prior. exactly, yeah. Okay. But, but wait, <laughs> but then if you have a newly diagnosed who was diagnosed 11 months ago, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how does, I mean, you would want to know whether or not they were in, I mean, they have the potential to be classified as in or out of care, right? Because yeah, yeah, it's, it's true. We didn't try to do that for the newly diagnosed, but for some of them, you certainly could. Okay. Um, and you, it's actually easier to classify them on the, the viral load suppression measure because that only requires the six months before enrollment. Um, so we did look at that a little bit, but for the purpose of this analysis, we just treated them all as newly diagnosed and didn't try to classify because we wouldn't have been able to do it for all of them. And so I'll get into the um, sort of the actual effectiveness findings so far. Um, and uh, you can see sort of from the bar chart um, showing the relative risks and the proportions from baseline proportion to uh, 12 months after enrollment. Um, so our newly diagnosed had no, as you were just pointing out, no sort of pre-enrollment measure of engagement in care, but 91% of them achieved engagement in care by our, our 12 month measure um, in the year after enrollment. And that was the same proportion that achieved uh, engagement in care among the previously diagnosed, but they started out at 74% engagement in care. Uh, so we had a relative risk uh, for the previously diagnosed of 1.24. Um, and then we looked at those subgroups, the previously diagnosed who were out of care versus current to care. And it was still a significant effect even among those who were current to care at enrollment and care coordination. So they went from 87% to 93%. Um, and had a relative risk of 1.06, so still a significant effect, but less of an improvement. Um, and we found that these uh, improvements uh, held at 25 of the 28 uh, funded care coordination programs, so 89% of the programs, which suggests to us that the overall effectiveness is not driven by just a few organizational types or a few large agencies, which is reassuring. And I think in, just in terms of sort of a a benchmark against which to compare that newly diagnosed 91%. Um, we can be thinking partly about the artist study with the 64% engagement in care, although it's not entirely fair because our newly diagnosed weren't diagnosed the instant that we started doing the 12 months of follow-up. They were diagnosed sometime in the 12 months before that. Um, but it's still it's a nice finding for the newly diagnosed, as well as knowing that we have significant improvement for the previously diagnosed. And then. Um, looking at the subgroup differences, so the, the overall relative risk is that vertical solid line with the confidence intervals on the dotted lines there. Um, and you can see how the subgroups sort of uh, broke out on either side of that overall um, relative risk for engagement to care, in care. Um, and the interest, so we had a greater um, engagement in care improvement among those who were younger, under or up, up to age 44. Um, those who were uninsured, those who were homeless at baseline, those who are not taking antiretrovirals at baseline, um, the more recently diagnosed, that last, um, what is that, that last sort of six years uh, of diagnosis states, and those who are not virally suppressed at baseline. The only group for whom, um, the only groups for whom we found uh, engagement in care not to be um, significantly improving were those who were um, virally suppressed at baseline, so that was 29% who were virally suppressed at baseline, they didn't show significant improvement. And those who had other race ethnicity, so that was actually just a tiny proportion who we couldn't categorize as any other race ethnicity, it was 3% of the people. Um, and then the interesting finding, the finding that goes in sort of a different direction from the others is recent hard drug use. So those who did not have recent hard drug use at baseline uh, improved more than those who did have recent hard drug use at baseline. Um, and our other sort of subgroup differences tended in the opposite direction, tended to be those who had more barriers at baseline improved more, but the recent hard drug use went in its own direction. 
Um, and going on to the viral load suppression measure, um, looking at the pre versus post uh, proportions and the overall uh, relative risk for um, viral load suppression uh, afterwards versus beforehand. Um, we saw that we had significant improvements. The previously diagnosed, we had a relative risk of 1.58 uh, and uh, went from 32% to 51%. Newly, di newly diagnosed got up to 66% uh, viral load suppression in that year after enrollment. And then uh, just taking those subgroups of previously diagnosed, um, the, uh, the effect was still significant even among those who were current to care at baseline with that relative risk of 1.34. Um, and just thinking about benchmarks for this, again, it's hard to find a perfect comparison, but um, our surveillance data suggests uh, for 2012, it was 58% basically of those, 58% uh, of newly diagnosed achieved viral load suppression in the 12 months after a diagnosis. Um, so we have a slightly higher proportion in our newly diagnosed group, but then again, they weren't quite as newly diagnosed because they had that year before enrollment to be diagnosed. Uh, we found that this uh, sort of tendency for improvement uh, held at 21, per, 21 of the 28 agencies uh, funded for care coordination. So that's 75% of the total agency sample. And looking at the subgroups, um, there were the, the significant improvements held for all the subgroups that we've been looking at, um, except those who had a CD4 count already at or above 500 at enrollment. And that was 19% of our sample had a CD4 count that high at enrollment. All our other subgroups showed improvement from uh, before to after enrollment. And the differences were fewer on viral load suppression, but um, those who were younger, again, showed greater improvement after enrollment. Uh, again, those who were more recently diagnosed improved more. And, uh, and then, the, of course, the people with the lowest uh, CD4 counts at baseline improved more. And then uh, we were encouraged to do this actually by a reviewer um, for the manuscript, the draft manuscript. Um, we were doing an intent to, street, intent to treat study, so we didn't actually require people to stay enrolled. We only required them to be alive 12 months after enrollment. And, uh, and it, as it turns out, about 39% of the total um, sample left care coordination at some point were closed out of the program in the first year of follow-up. So um, we wanted to look at how the effects may have differed by um, duration of enrollment during that follow-up period. Um, as it turns out, uh, just basically the median was just over half a year. Median enrollment duration in that year of follow-up was just over half of a year. So we cut it into three groups, those who were enrolled for uh, up to six months of this follow-up period, those who were enrolled somewhere between six months and a year of the follow-up period, and those who were enrolled throughout the full year of follow-up. And you can see that the, um, the relative risks remain significant for um, all of those groups, but there's sort of this trend toward um, greater, greater relative risk, greater improvement among those who were enrolled for a longer portion of the follow-up period. Um, and there's a significant difference between those who were enrolled only up to six months of the follow-up period and those who were enrolled throughout the follow-up period. So it's sort of the start, uh, you know, it gives us sort of a hint of a dose-response effect that's um, something we want to look into further. And that brings us to our next steps and discussion. Um, so in terms of limitations, uh, we are sort of aware that labs are an imperfect proxy for primary care, although it's become increasingly sort of widely accepted to use labs and surveillance for um, evidence of care. And uh, you can either overstate care engagement to the extent that some labs happen in the course of acute care inpatient uh, or emergency department visits. Um, and then uh, I think more often the concern is that not all primary care visits these days are generating labs. Um, people are monitoring less and less frequently, so we may be missing some actual care. Um, and then as you saw with sort of the subgroup differences, um, some of the groups that start out in a better place in enrollment have less room for improvement, uh, so we you know, we didn't necessarily only, always find significant improvement for those groups. Uh, and then the, the biggest consideration with an observational study of this kind, especially in New York City, is that we are not the only game in town. We know that. Um, we have a lot of sort of Ryan White Part A funding to distribute, but um, there is a whole sort of, there's a, an amazing tapestry of HIV services, social and uh, medical, out there in New York City, and we are just one um, program. So people are availing themselves of many different programs, um, and improvement could be attributed to any number of uh, changes in care and treatment and the supportive service structure around it. 
And then, of course, we're um, doing all of this in a time when people are experiencing the transition to Affordable Care Act and Medicaid reform in New York. Um, so some of our clients are, are getting more of this type of case management elsewhere. And uh, actually, some of that affects their eligibility for care coordination because Ryan White is meant to be the payer of last resort. Um, so we can't deliver the same package of care coordination services to people who are getting medical case management through um, Medicaid, Medicare or uh, Medicaid. And uh, in terms of our overall conclusions from this first analysis, um, we, were, we were pleased that short-term uh, engagement in care and viral suppression improvements were robust across almost all of the subgroups that we looked at. Um, we had a sort of good number of subgroups we were able to see through the combination of surveillance data and e-share data. Um, but the um, improvements were greatest among those previously diagnosed and out of care and enrollment. Um, newly diagnosed also definitely showed promising outcomes based on the benchmarks that we have available for that group. Um, and it seems that a uh, care coordination program may substantially improve short-term adherence to care and treatment among people at risk, especially at those at risk for suboptimal outcomes. Um, with that one funny finding on drug use that the group that was using hard drugs at enrollment didn't uh, improve as much, although they still significantly improved, they didn't improve as much as those who uh, were not using hard drugs at enrollment. So where we are now, um, I, it's nice, I've been moving some more bullets from the lower part up into the <laughs> higher part here. Um, so we got our initial IRB approvals done, uh, CUNY and DOHMH. Um, we're in a different world in DOHMH these days, and the IRB is just a pleasure to deal with. Um, really? Yes, oh Glad my gosh, <laughs> it's been amazing. And um, our preliminary data sets were all uh, created and cleaned uh, and have been set up. There's even a synthetic data set. Um, for use at CUNY um, because we can't actually provide the line level. I know your question was a good one, but we can't actually provide the line level surveillance data to anyone outside of uh, Department of Health. So they've been working with a synthetic data set to develop some of the code for us to use at DOHMH. Right. And then you do the analysis. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's how it, it's sort of legal within our agreement with the state for surveillance. Um, and our initial data analyses were just disseminated or still sort of impressed, but and then the um, study instruments and procedures uh, with help from Sarah there of CUNY have been uh, drafted and submitted to our IRBs for AIM-2 um, and approved on the DOHMH side already for AIM-2. And where we're going are additional analyses, many additional analyses under AIM-1, um, the comparison group work uh, Dennis mentioned, an assessment of longer term versions of outcomes for engagement care and viral suppression. Um, we can begin to look at determinants of success um, based on the e-share data, e-share sort of predictors of outcomes. Um, and uh, we also are uh, trying, preparing, we're recruiting interviewers. So if you know anybody who's interested in doing interviewing, we can talk more. We have a position announcement out there through Public Health Solutions. Good. Um, <laughs> and uh, we should be, we, we're looking particularly for people who speak Spanish and English. Um, and then French is also a language in which we'll be doing the interviews. Um, and uh, we'll be training those people this winter. And then site assessments and client interviews can begin this winter. Um, and we are also working on refining our costing data for the modeling that Dennis talked about, the cost effectiveness modeling work. Uh, and in terms of sort of AIM 1, uh, what's coming? Um, the pre and post versions of long-term outcomes, so we're, we're looking at sort of a 24-month version and a 36-month version of engagement care and viral lip suppression. It changes our sample if we try to do a you know, fair comparison of pre-enrollment to post-enrollment. The beautiful thing about the surveillance data, um, this is one part of the magic, is that you can look back as far in time, you know, you can go back at least to 2005 because of the existence of all viral loads and CD4s in New York City surveillance. Um, from that time forward uh, for anyone who was diagnosed that far back. So we, we can do, eventually we could do four year pre and post. Um, and then the uh, matching of clients to other people living with HIV in the registry uh, who have some evidence of care. Um, we've been uh, translating the, the eligibility criteria that I went over, the, you know, what made you med medically eligible for care coordination, translating that to sort of surveillance um, analogs, so using lab data, we can sort of figure out who's sporadically in care, who's out of care, who's newly diagnosed, um, who's uh, had viral load rebound, those kinds of things. So we're trying to come up with comparison group in the registry who meet those eligibility criteria for care coordination. Um, and that's sort of the first step at coming up with a reasonable match. And then 
Um, the trickiest part that I think we're working out this week is coming up with a reasonable anchor for the follow-up for those um, comparison group members because they don't have a natural enrollment date as the start of follow-up um, like the care coordination program enrollees do. So we're trying to find something that's a reasonable um, sort of, you know, not entirely arbitrary start of follow-up for those people uh, based on when they were eligible for the program and also um, sort of when they were in care. Uh, and then we're going to be using the final step for this match, uh, for this comparison, we'll be using propensity score matching. And we've identified, and of course, it's limited to variables that exist in the registry, you know, because there's a common data source for the comparison group and the enrollees. Um, but we've been coming up with a number of variables in the registry that we can use to further sort of even out the differences between those who are enrolled in care coordination and those who weren't enrolled in care coordination. Uh, and then for AIM2, the client interviews, it's meant to be um, self-administered, so it's an online survey um, set up with the audio component. It's an ACASI uh, tool, um, and clients will have a client-specific login, so uh, we'll be able to track um, their responses but link those responses to e-share data and surveillance data as well. Um, and the domains for the interview include uh, HIV-related health literacy, HIV care and care coordination program experience, um, including some of the patient's perception of burden of being in the in program and benefit of being in the program. Experienced uh, stigma and discrimination in healthcare, we adapted a standardized uh, stigma scale um, for our purposes. And then social support and HIV disclosure using a standardized scale for social support. Challenges in self-efficacy for adherence, um, adherence to appointments and adherence to treatment, separate scales. Um, and drug and alcohol use, mental health, management of other chronic conditions. So some of those things that have come up in the literature as uh, common predictors of suboptimal out out outcomes we're measuring in the interview tool. Uh, and then AIM-3, this is the part uh, for which we really rely on our consultants and other study team members outside of CUNY and DOHMH, uh, but we're uh, for the assessing a cost, effect cost effectiveness, we are using um, the cost data that we have at DOHMH, which includes sort of how much we're paying now, how much we actually spend on care coordination, our reimbursement, according to our reimbursement model, um, and then the budgets the agencies produce, uh, which you know we're not always reimbursing all of, but they have their budgets for what they think things cost uh, to deliver care coordination, including the overhead. Um, and then we're also looking at service provision utilization by agency um, to come up with sort of average costs per service and cost per client. Um, and the purpose of all this is to be able to combine those kinds of cost data with our health outcomes effectiveness data, like the estimates that we have from this first analysis, um, to be able to sort of measure, to come up with a cost effectiveness ratio, so relative to usual care, and we're accounting specifically for um, HIV infections averted and uh, increase in quality adjusted life years gained uh, with care coordination. And uh, this is sort of not as much my area, but very exciting to be able to start to translate uh, the work that we do do into this kind of uh, really critical sort of practical information for others considering uh, adopting the model um, or scaling up this kind of program. Uh, and then this is the, uh, these are people who sort of not all on, the, some of them on the study team, but some of them not on the current study team, but people who are essential to our um, process of developing care coordination and developing the, the grant work. Um, Fabienne was the person who at Department of Health uh, sort of built the care coordination program into what it is. Um, and uh, the PACT program I mentioned, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital and Partners in Health, really gave us that uh, curriculum for health promotion. Uh, and of course the data that we get from the providers who are reporting on their care coordination clients is critical to all of this um, work for the data analysis. And uh, we are happy to have that new grant, the NIH grant, as well as the existing Ryan White grant, which keeps these services going. Part of the beauty of being at the Department of Health is having, you know, being able to do a large scale study by virtue of being able to roll out a large scale intervention with funding from HRSA. Thank you.